Hey there! Welcome to What Could Go Wrong Models. For my first build, I'm going to start off with the Star Wars ATST kit from Bandai. I picked this kit because it looked the least intimidating out of all the other Bandai kits that I've just recently purchased. It's got a pretty uniform color scheme and calls for some weathering, which will help hide any screw ups. I'm pretty new to this hobby, but I'm excited to go. So let's get on with the montage. I was really excited to start putting this model together. I'd heard Bandai kits were the best for their engineering, fit of the pieces, level of detail, and I was not disappointed. This kit was really fun to build. It actually felt like putting a machine together. The pieces just fit so well. Because the kit is poseable, a lot of the parts allowed for mechanical movement. And this just added to the depth of realism as if you were putting a machine together. I really got to give Bandai engineers credit. This is some really nice work. When I got to building the cockpit, I realized that I'm going to need to paint the inside now before putting the rest of it together, otherwise it's just going to be completely inaccessible. So after a couple of coats of Tamiya Fine Surface Primer, I sprayed the inside with Tamiya's Medium Sea Grey. I started with the least intimidating aspect of the cockpit, painting the chairs flat black. An easy starting point, the pilots are just going to be sitting in the chairs anyways. After I get the seats done, I looked at some of the reference images from Return of the Jedi just to see where uh, color was applied. And Actually a lot of that cockpit, especially the front console, is just grey. There's not a whole lot of detail to it. So I applied a couple of different shades of grey, some silvers and then the typical imperial color scheme on the buttons, red, yellows, whites, things like that, just to make it interesting. Took some liberties here and there, you know, knowing that this cockpit is, without taking the top off, you're not gonna see any of this detail. So uh, I wasn't too concerned with accuracy, I just wanted to have some practice. You know, that's really what this is all about, is trying my hand at new things. Now after painting the cockpit, I moved on to painting the figures. This is the first time that I've ever painted a minifigure or flesh tones before. Anything this small really, so I was a little bit nervous. In the end, I think they turned out quite well. After that, I applied a dark wash to the figures in the cockpit and then sealed it in with a clear coat. Now with the cockpit complete, I could finish building the model. I uh, screwed up the legs. I had to take the feet off and reseat them in the proper position, but once I did that, she was put together. I gave the whole model two coats of the same Tamiya surface primer. The grey is actually pretty nice and could be used as a base coat, but I'm going to be using this neutral grey as a base coat instead, a little bit darker, so that I can create some shading effects with it. So I see a lot of model builders do this technique of shading, giving it a dark undercoat and then spraying a lighter color over top of it in a very precise fashion. That way it gives the edges and recessed areas a bit more of a shaded look, so that's what I plan on doing with the ATST. This was one of my favorite parts of the entire build, just putting on a smooth, clean base coat. It was very satisfying. Once I finished the dark undercoat on the model, I moved on to the lighter primary color for the ATST, and I decided to use a stippling technique that I'd seen uh, done primarily for aircraft models. This is where the paint is applied. Instead of a uniform spray coat, it's, it's kind of dotted on using the airbrush. I 
never done this technique before, so I decided to do a little bit of practice on the bottom of the foot and just see how the colors would blend and what the overall effect would look like. The light gray I'm using here is Tamiya's flat sky gray. A quick comparison of the light gray to the dark gray. I think it looks pretty good. Right before starting this part of the process, I did end up getting a new airbrush and really glad that I did. I got an Iwata Eclipse and the spring action on this brush was really tight. It made the stippling a lot easier to do, but this meant this was a new technique and a new brush, so I was prone to screwing up here and there. So to me this was the most daunting part of the whole process, applying color to the head of the model where it's going to be most visible. So I took my time and used a very, very thin diluted mixture of the paint so that any overspray or excess wouldn't ruin the whole thing. But it did mean going over with a lot of different passes, so patience is definitely a virtue in this case. In mid-spray, this is when my power went out and I had to clean the airbrush in the dark with only a foam light. Not fun. The larger flat area surfaces Focus the light gray color into the center of the panel, leaving the outer edges to be a little bit darker, just to create that color modulation effect. And here's the final product of the base coats. I was really pleased with how this turned out on my first attempt at two-tone shading. And with the base coat complete, it's time to move on to the fun stuff. The first weathering effect I wanted to apply was scorch marks from Blast Hits. I figured in order to do this, I'm going to use a very light touch with the airbrush and a very thinned down paint. Use multiple passes to build up the color and density. The last thing I want to do is spray a bunch of black paint that's way too thick. So again, I started at the feet with my first attempt. Just in case I do screw up, I can probably cover it with the mud that I'll be using later on. The paint was so thin that, that sometimes I couldn't tell that the airbrush was actually spraying anything out. But it worked out really well in order to apply different levels of scorching. Once I felt more comfortable with the technique, I moved further up the leg, thinking about directionality of scorch marks and putting a little bit of thought into their, their placement, but really just whatever I thought looked good. This blast hit didn't go as smoothly as the others, as you can see, but it ended up being one of my favorite details in the end, which you'll see when I get to the chipping. While I had the black paint loaded in the airbrush, I decided to scorch the exhaust vents. Once the scorching was complete, I moved on to chipping and edge wear. This is the first time that I've done any sort of chipping before, so quite the experiment for me, and as usual, I started at the bottom, on the undercarriage where it's least visible, just in case. I decided that I would try chipping using a brush instead of a sponge, I just felt that the scale of this model required a little bit of uh, a little bit larger chips. I had started off with the plan that the chipping would focus primarily on the bottom of the model, on the legs and the underside of the head. The thought would be that debris from blasters and explosions would be coming from below and in front. But as I went along, I ended up just getting a little too carried away. With the process, I thought that the chipping and the edge wear looked really good. Uh, the color that I was using contrasted very well, and uh, those plans kind of went out the window. So I think I still focused primarily with that thought in mind. You'll definitely see more of that chipping and edge wear towards the front leading edges of the model than, than the rear, but uh, definitely didn't stick to the same plans that I had. The other aspect of edgeware that I wanted to include was some directional scratches. Again, thinking about how the machine would be walking through a forest like in Return of the Jedi, 
tree branches, leaves would scratch along the leading edges of the machine. So I added some directional scratches to, to indicate that. I decided to use the same chipping color and fill in a couple of the darker blast marks. This really made the detail pop. It turned out to be one of my favorite parts of the entire paint job. And then I moved on to creating deep chips. I used a medium gray and applied it to areas that had a larger surface area, just to simulate another layer of paint or material that was being worn away. I ended up really liking the look of this effect. I originally planned to use it sparingly, and only use it on corners or areas of large wear. But it looked so good that I ended up applying quite a bit of the effect to the legs and really emphasized that idea of extra wear and tear on the lower half of the walker. Out of all the stages of building this kit, I think I spent most of my time on the chipping. I mean, I spent a lot of time on chipping. I'm sure other people out there could do it a lot faster, but I really wanted to get this detail to look right. Now this channel is called What Could Go Wrong Models, so let me tell you what went wrong. I applied a gloss coat to the model in preparation for the pin washing, but I dropped it. I was also using a lacquer based gloss spray and I didn't know at the time that it would eat through the acrylic paint. So it ended up scratching the top coat of the paint. And as you can see here, it actually blends in a little bit with some of the wear and tear, so let's call it a happy accident. For the pin washing, I decided to use an enamel based panel liner from AK Interactive. And to be honest, I had no idea what I was doing. I started by pin washing some of the details, but felt that the model needed a little bit more of a dirtier look. So I thinned down the wash and applied it all over the model. I removed the excess with a cotton bud, and this ended up giving it a nice, grungier look. I still did a pin wash in a lot of the edges and crevices, just to give that extra shadow effect and let those details really stand out. For the pin wash, I used a small thin brush loaded with thinner to clean up excess paint. This was a lot of trial and error because I found the paint moved around quite a bit. So it was uh, an exercise in removing some and pushing paint back into the crevice where I really wanted it. Often this caused me to remove too much paint and have to redo the process. So like I said, a lot of trial and error. Here's where I learned how important it is to have even gloss coat coverage on your model. Areas where I didn't have sufficient gloss coverage caused the thinned out panel liner to spread out from the point of contact on the model. I was able to clean it up, but I eventually went back and did a second gloss coat with better coverage. And that allowed me to panel line these little rivet areas much better. One really odd thing that happened was I put my brush close to this part of the model and without even touching it, it sort of magically filled in some shade, as you can see here. I still don't know what caused it. I was able to clean it away, but it was almost like that part of the model reacted with the chemicals in the paint. If anybody has an explanation behind that, if you've seen that before, please drop a comment, let me know. I'm still very curious. Next up was the part I was looking forward to the most, streaking grime. For this I'm using AK Interactive's interior streaking effects. Just like the pin wash, it is an enamel based product, so I'll be applying it and then removing it selectively in order to get the effect that I'm looking for. It did take me a couple of attempts to dial in how much to remove. I did want this effect to be more subtle instead of having big huge streaks, but I ended up taking off way too much to begin with and had to reapply. Once I got hang of the technique, I applied the streaking grime to corners, extrusions, panels, places where I thought water would be collecting and running if this was a real sized machine. For each streak, I do a couple of passes with a thinner on a brush. 
I'd do one pass, let it dry, and then go back at it again, and repeat this until I got the opacity that I wanted. The next time I do streaking grime, I'll definitely get a smaller flat brush. The only one that I had was too large and didn't have enough finesse for this size of model. In the end I made it work, but next time I'm definitely going to be using a smaller flat brush. I probably had the most fun doing this part of the weathering. When everything was going right, it was really satisfying. For some areas where I wanted stains more than streaks, I used a stippled motion on the brush instead of a streaking motion, and this blended the color in nicely with soft feathered edges. Next up was to apply some earth effects. For this, I used the brown earth dust and dirt deposit enamel product from AK Interactive. I wanted to have some heavier deposits on the feet and some dirt splashes up the legs and head. To be honest, the feet didn't really turn out how I would hoped. I couldn't manipulate the product as easily as the others and I couldn't get it to feather very well. I ended up settling for this dirty look. I'll definitely have to practice with this more. The dirt spray on the other hand worked very nicely with a large brush flicking material onto the model. Lastly, I had received these weathering pencils as a Christmas gift right as I finished the dirt effects. I really wanted to give them a try, so I grabbed the olive green and looked to add some color variation just to experiment. I was really impressed with how well these blended and liked how they added a nice subtle green tone. So I found some other spots on the model that I just decided to apply this and give it an extra little bit of variation. I called it wraps on the weathering at this point, but I was feeling disappointed that the interior wouldn't be seen without taking the lid off. So I looked for a way to light the interior without rebuilding the model. I had just purchased a soldering iron and the last time I soldered anything was in 1997 for shop class. So of course I'd jump right in by soldering two half millimeter SMD LEDs. Eventually. After a lot of trial and error, I finally got the LEDs wired. I hot glued the wires for the LEDs to the roof of the cockpit, and then soldered the wires to the battery casing. Pop in a couple of 1.5 volt batteries and we've got our cockpit lights. All that's left now is to see what it looks like. I had a lot of fun working on this kit, and for my first real build and weathering I was quite happy with the result. I learned a lot throughout the process, but there's three key things that I'm going to take away into the next build and every build thereafter. 
Number one, lacquer gloss melts acrylic. I'll be using an acrylic based gloss coat over top of acrylic based paint from now on and avoid any unwanted interactions. Number two, I'll be using a cloth instead of paper towel to wipe away excess paint off of my brushes. I found that the paper towel was causing fibers to get caught in the brush and then transferred onto the model. And lastly, number three, this is something that I had heard about in other videos, that enamel thinner can eat through Bandai plastic. I did find this out the hard way as a crack appeared in the hinge of the hip joint. Now it didn't destroy the model, but it makes posing it just a little bit more delicate. So to avoid this in future Bandai kits, I'm going to prime the insides of the pieces, even if they're not going to be displayed. Hopefully this will keep the enamel thinner from eating away at the thinner plastic areas. Well, that's it. Thanks so much for joining me on my first video. I hope you enjoyed it, or maybe you learned from my mistakes. Feel free to leave a comment. I'd love to hear what you think, either about the video or the model. Thanks again, and hope to see you in the next one.